God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty Thank you to the Eddies and Sheila, I thank you uh, as well. I wanted to say this morning, I didn't mention it during our uh, announcements, uh, but yesterday we had the men's breakfast and had a, a great time there, a fellowship, um, and had uh, good food, had plenty of food, and uh, then we had a time of prayer, a little season of prayer. Of course, it's a, when, when I say a men's breakfast, it's always a prayer breakfast. We want to gather the men of the church to pray uh, for matters of the church and what have you. But then we had uh, some preaching from God's word as well, and it was a good time. I hope I want to like to schedule another one before the year is out, and I hope uh, it can be open to, to more of the men if you, uh, to be able to come or should I say schedules will be open so that more men uh, can come on the next one as well. And uh, I just find it to be a great blessing to fellowship with the men of the church. If you have your Bibles this morning, let's go ahead and open to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, it's the fourth Gospel of the New Testament. I wanted to ask you something. Have you ever said to yourself, well, now I know who God is. That sounds kind of crazy, doesn't it? 
But, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who say they know God, and uh, they'll go through life thinking that they know God because they've read about something about God, but really they don't know God. Now, that might sound crazy uh, as well because we know Jesus, we say, and uh, that's a good thing. But we have God's word. It teaches us who Jesus is. It teaches us who God is. We have to study it, though. We have to be under the teaching of God's word, really, to understand some of the things uh, that God's word uh, teaches us. In uh, last time's message, remember, we discovered that the Bible is a spiritual compass and map, and it gives us guidance in our life. When God put his Holy Spirit in us, the Holy Spirit... uh, won't tell us to do something contrary to what God's word tells us to do. It works in unison with God's work. In fact, God places his Holy Spirit in us to teach us about his word, about God, about Jesus, and uh, the Holy Spirit to teach us all the things that we find in here and to guide us into that direction. And so we can look at scripture as a map and as a compass and come to it for all the different issues that come up in our lives. That's what the Bible is for. And so we looked at uh, what was the right way last time, and uh, we found that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man cometh unto the Father but by him. If someone says, oh, I know God, I know all about God, but they don't know Jesus, then they don't know God. Uh, And you you can just uh, see the things that we've been studying here and how there's actually people who thought that way. They knew God, but they didn't know God. But they said they did and thought they did, but they were wrong. And then when Jesus came to explain it to them, they rejected him who was God in the flesh. And so it's no wonder today when somebody says, now I know God, I thought I knew him. And it wasn't a a crazy thing for me when I thought I knew God because I had read the entire Bible. I had been brought up around, you know, uh, a Christian uh, environment uh, to some extent and thought I knew God, but I didn't know God. I didn't know God until after I was saved. The moment I was saved, everything I thought about God changed and shifted uh, to what the Word of God says. Uh, Not what I thought the Word of God says, but what the Word of God says. And I began to understand it. What a wonderful day that was when I realized that I now know God. I didn't know everything about God. He's infinite. But I, I come to know God in the way of the Bible as it showed me who he was. And as I was led to understand that I needed Jesus Christ as my Savior. And so today, we're going to find our Lord's disciples struggle to understand who God is, and he helps them understand that he is one with the Father. Therefore, if you know Jesus, you know God. If you know God, you know Jesus, and you love them both. You cannot pick and choose. It's not, you don't say, well, I love this one, but yeah, the other ones I'm not too you know, hot on. That. Wait a minute. That's not how you come to know God. That's not knowing God at all. Uh, in a message I've entitled, Do You Love Jesus? We're going to be challenged to keep our Lord's commandments, recognize the, com- the comforter and the peace that he has, and love Jesus. That's what this is going to challenge us to do and remind us to do. Uh, So, if you're in chapter 14, where we're going to pick up today from last time, in that uh, road sign, that big fat road sign there in verse 6, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but my me. We stop there. Here's where we're picking up. Verse 7, if he had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? 
Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Let's ask God's blessing on his word. Father, we uh, ask your blessing now upon your word that we have read. May it speak to our hearts and uh, the other things that we'll look at here this morning as well. Open our hearts and our minds, Lord, to your word and allow your Holy Spirit to teach us uh, this passage that we'll be uh, studying here and looking at uh, this morning and that pastor is preaching. Lord, I want to proclaim your word and I, I desire that your Holy Spirit helps us all to understand it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, in these verses I read, Jesus is uh, teaching his disciples that he and God are one. You can't separate the two. They're one. They're together. Now, this was a foundational truth that our Lord was teaching to his disciples because you cannot separate the two. They're one. And the Jews wanted to believe just in God and not in Jesus. They wanted that separation, but you cannot do that. The disciples were probably prone to go along with what they had learned all their lives. There's God. There's God. Yes, there's a Messiah, but there's God. There's two separate. But Jesus is saying we're one. We're the same thing. Um, and so as he's teaching them this, he tells them to believe that he is in the Father and the Father is in him. If not, then believe in the works he did. That's what he told them. Believe in my works. If you can't believe that the Father and I are one, then believe in the works. Jesus was trying to get them to believe. And friends, we know Jesus and we know God when we know either one of them. We can understand them. That's what Jesus is telling them. That's what he wants them to understand and to take home with them. And so we are to believe the word of God. Um, we come to know this, this teaching that Jesus is one with God through the preaching and the teaching of God's word. Through our reading of God's word, we can uh, find this as well. Uh, maybe you're thinking, how can we believe the works that Jesus did, though, Pastor? Every work Jesus did that I find in the Bible, I believe it. Think about that. Have you ever thought of it that way? Or do you start thinking, hmm, what has he done? <laughs> Everything he has done that he tells us about himself, I believe it all. I believe those works, and I wasn't ever there. I believe it because I believe the Bible. I believe that Jesus is one with God because the Bible says so. Uh, even though I wasn't there when Jesus talked to these disciples, I have God's word. I believe it. And so don't ever say, well, I don't know where his works are. I mean, you know, what's he doing today? Well, there, he's doing a lot today, too. <laughs> uh, when I was saved, that was by, because of Jesus. That was because of God. That was because of the Holy Spirit. And the same thing for you. That was a miracle of God. That was a work of God. And if you're a Christian, you have a very work that you can rejoice in and say, you know, I believe him for that work he did in my life. And I'm sold out. I'm going to be a Christian the rest of my life. And place my faith in him, and nobody's ever going to change it. It was a great work that he did. And then what about the Holy Spirit being placed in us? We're sealed with the Holy Spirit. A great work of God. We can believe in God because of the things that he has shown us, not only in his word, but what he actually does in our lives. We don't have any excuse not to. Jesus, uh, every work that he did, he wanted them to believe in it. Now, he said that to them for our sakes, because we know all scriptures are for us as well. But he said it directly to them. Perhaps there were some who were just 
you know, like Thomas, who was asking questions here, um, uh, they were wondering certain things. They didn't know everything, and they were trying to get Jesus to help them to understand. He wanted them to believe his words and his works to help them to understand. And so look at verse 15. Jesus continues on. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Where have we heard that from before? Well, from God. <laughs> well, Jesus is saying this uh, to them pretty straightforward. So, uh, do you love Jesus? I'm talking to you now and, and me. I love the Lord. Uh, I, I love his word. I love everything about it. I love the Christian walk and talk and, and our Savior and God. I, I, I love the Lord. I love Jesus. And so I want you to think about this for a minute. And because I do love him, I want to do whatever he commands me to do, don't you? I mean, I love the Lord. I want, I want to please him. I want him to be uh, pleased with my life. I want him to recognize that I'm trying to do everything he wants me to do. Can I do everything? No, I, I'm just a man. But when I fail to do exactly what I feel the Lord wants me to do, he shows mercy and kindness because he knows my heart is in the, white, the right place. I want to serve him the best that I can and follow his commandments, which, by the way, are not grievous, is what uh, Scripture uh, tells us. Uh, turn back to chapter 13 right here in the Gospel of John. And look at verse 34. Jesus tells his disciples, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. And so there's a commandment, a new commandment. Um, we've heard rend a rendition of this in the Old Testament, loving our neighbors as ourselves. But Jesus here specifically, that ye love one another. And then he says in verse 35, But by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. There is a commandment. Uh, to if you love me, follow my commandments. And there's one right there. Uh, look at uh, chapter uh, let me 14, but go jump down to verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Oh, thank you, Lord. He wants to make himself known to us. That's what that manifest means. He wants to unfold himself. He wants us to know who he is. I'm so thankful for that. I heard a lot about Jesus before I was saved, but I wasn't convinced of anything other than he was just like anybody else. Uh, and, you know, it was a, a story or whatever. I didn't know what to think until I began to read the Bible myself. And I didn't grow up uh, going to church regularly. I went a few times, but the times that I did go, I never doubted Jesus. I just didn't know him or about him. But I began to learn uh, look at verse 23 in uh, that same chapter, 14. It says, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. You see how personal this is getting? Jesus was very, very personal. This is showing that not only Jesus Christ, the Son of God, but God the Father will love us if we keep the words of Jesus. Which, by the, the way, Jesus tells us that God gave them to him. And he's, doing, he's only telling them what God has told him to say. He's doing the works that God told him to do. Why? Well, because they're one. Jesus tells us in Scripture that he said, my Father is greater than I am. And yet they are one. How incredible uh, this teaching is. Now uh, look at uh, verse, uh, where was I here? Uh, chapter 15 and verse 12. Here still in John. Now Jesus said, this is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. Now that kind of makes us uh, think there. But 
if, if we really think about these passages we looked at, then we can recognize that our love for one another is a direct reflection of our love for God, our love of Jesus. Because if we love him like we are to love him in a relationship now that we have as born-again believers, well, then we're going to love one another because we're going to see Jesus, the one that we love with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, God and Jesus, well, then we're going to see Jesus in you, and therefore I will see Jesus in you, and I will love you as Jesus commands us to do. It's pretty powerful when you think about it. What do we all have in common as Christians? Christ in us. How can we say then that we do not love someone who has Christ in them when we say that we love Jesus? See, it leaves some things for us to really think about in our Christian walk. Um, there's, there's consequences to all of this, and the Bible helps us with that. Hold your place here in John and go over to 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. I hear those pages turning, so I'll wait a, a moment. I'm no, in no rush to get through this. I'm in no hurry. I want to take all the time we need uh, for everybody to understand what the Bible is saying here. Look at uh, chapter 3 and verse 14. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth you in you, and ye have overcome uh, the wicked one. But that's not what I wanted to read, but I like it. <laughs> Look over at verse 14. I was reading uh, uh, chapter 2, but chapter 3 and verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. Amen. Uh, he that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Uh-oh. There's a telltale right there. Okay. Uh, and then uh, look in chapter 4 and verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God. Why? Because God is love. Uh, it's pretty clear uh, here what scripture is saying. And then look at verse 20 in that chapter 4. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, now just think of what I just said a moment ago. If I look out, I see you all here, and I see Jesus in you, how can I say I love God if I don't love you? It's crazy, isn't it? Uh, and he goes on, and he says, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath uh, seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen, and how can he say that as well? You see, he's a liar. There's proof text there. Now look at chapter 5 of that same book. John was used, uh, the Holy Spirit used the Apostle John to write so much about love that has helps all of us to mature in our Christian walk. It's just a wonderful study, this man, and how the Holy Spirit has used him. Uh, and then uh, here in chapter 5, verse 2 reads, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments <clears throat> are not grievous, meaning you can do it. Just do what he says. Just think of the two great commandments. Work on those. All the other things will shift and adjust and, and are supposed to fall under those two umbrella, if you will, uh, commandments. The first one being to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second one is to love our neighbors as ourselves. Uh, to, to love one another is a specific commandment of our Lord to love the brethren especially. And he makes it very clear. Uh, uh, I thought to myself, Jesus, you know, he says that he loves his disciples. Uh, he fed them. He taught them. He prayed for them. He fellowshiped with them. He comforted them. He washed their feet, and et cetera, et cetera. 
And ultimately, he died for them like he did for you and, and me. That's how much he loved us. We were on his mind. All humanity was. He set that love bar very high, very high. He's serious about it. God is serious about it. First, the love for him, Jesus Christ, for God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and then secondly, for one another, uh, for believers. I want to read another verse here back in uh, today's chapter, chapter 14. Jesus just said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And here's what he says in verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Whew. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Oh my goodness. Not only are they to know that Jesus and God are one, but what is Jesus saying here? Once we become believers, we become one with God. I mean, he's in us. We're in him. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's in that. Okay. I guess nobody else here is as, as excited as I am. Uh, but I just want to shout a, you know, uh, amen. And I've been wanting to do that through this whole chapter. Even when I, I've been studying this on my own, I'm just like, wow. I would have loved to have been there while Jesus was teaching these wonderful truths and just to hear his voice saying those things, the very son of God. But you know what? I have it right here. I hear it in my voice when I read it, but I know it's his voice that penned these very things. And uh, it's, it's really exciting. Uh, I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. So he's just teaching them that he and the Father are one. Now he's saying, if you're saved, whoop, I'm in you, and you're in me. So... If we love uh, Jesus, God gives us a comforter, and that's the spirit of truth. If we love Jesus, if we don't, we have to wait until we do love Jesus. Because you're not going, if you don't love Jesus, the Holy Spirit is not going to be given to you. It's just how it is. Jesus said in verse 6 of this same chapter, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father. He could have easily said on there, no man's going to get the Holy Spirit either <laughs> until you come to me. You have to come through me. And that's okay. Uh, that's God's direction for us. Um, the spirit of truth is the Holy Spirit. And this prom, uh, promise was fulfilled for the disciples later on in chapter 20 and 22 when Jesus breathes on them the Holy Spirit. And then later in Acts chapter 2 and, and verse 4 there at uh, Pentecost, uh, when uh, they were uh, all received the Holy Spirit, all the disciples. But God seals Christians with his Holy Spirit when we're saved, and he, he becomes our comforter, giving you and I an assurance that what we are reading is actual and factual and true, not only in Scripture and Word, but now in us. Any doubts you have ought to have been wiped away because of this. Uh, when the Holy Spirit comes in to take his abode uh, within, within you and to guide you. Uh, and he does that in the exercise of God's word. He, he bears witness of God's truth. And we, we see that because of the Holy Spirit. He illuminates our minds when we're reading scripture. And he sanctifies us or sets us apart, if you will, for God's work. And he sheds God's love abroad in our heart. Wow. He does all kinds of other things, but I'm trying to be as personal as I can what he's doing for you and me. Let's not forget the fruits of the Holy Spirit that manifest in us, too, when we're not grieving the Holy Spirit. We talked about this morning in the Sunday school class, and we're having a great Sunday school class. I'm telling you, it's, it's been wonderful. 
And uh, in our Sunday school class, we went to Galatians 5.18 that says, Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Ghost. And, uh, you know, when you think about that passage of Scripture, if we grieve the Holy Spirit uh, because we're drinking wine or doing something else that the Holy Spirit is, has already tried to teach us not to do those things, well, then it's really hard to sense the fruit of the Holy Spirit in us because we're quenching it. We're quenching the Spirit. So we have to put aside distractions, let the Holy Spirit have his, his way in us. He knows what fruits, he knows what needs we have, what comforts we need, and he's wanting to manifest them, make them known in our life and in our presence uh, to comfort us. And really, the Holy Spirit never leaves us alone, and he's always there in all of our sorrows as well as in our joys. The Holy Spirit is there to comfort us and be there with us, representing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He's a representative part of the Trinity. And thank God for the Holy Spirit. Uh, look over with me. Hold your place in John. Go over to the book of Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. I hope you look up your scripture passages with me. I appreciate it when you do. If you don't have one, there's one in the front there. But why do I say that? It's easy just to listen. If you can read and, and you are able to open up the book, what I want you to remember more than anything else is what the Bible says. Yes, pastor is, is vocalizing and I'm preaching. I'm proclaiming the word of God. But you need to set your eyes on it and see it. Let it get imprinted uh, upon your hearts because you're looking at it too, validating that what I'm saying is from the word of God. Don't take my word for everything. But God's word, walk out of here with it today. Remember it because you read it yourself. You heard it as well. It was just confirming what it, it uh, uh, says here. Romans chapter 5 and verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Thank you, God. Thank you for that. The disciples needed this comfort. Jesus was soon to depart. And did not leave them comfortless. He told them he'll be coming back to them. And I'm sure that brought them some comfort, but they had become so attached to, to him, so dependent upon him, uh, walking and talking and going wherever Jesus went and listening to everything that he said, uh, that he told them, I'll be back. He told them to love him and to show it by keeping his commandments and joyfully uh, his words as well. You know, when Jesus left, he wanted them to continue with those commandments. He says, I'll be back, but love me by keeping my commandments. And when I come back, of course, this is true for you and I, when he does come back, hopefully he'll find all of us loving him and keeping his commandments. That's what we ought to do as we wait for him. Well, there's a whole lot of other distractions out there. But, you know, the, the, the majority of our time ought to be spent con being concerned about our Christian walk and walking with the Lord and, and serving him. And I mean all of our, whatsoever we do, of course, not just the majority of our time. I mean, sometimes we got to sleep and <laughs> sometimes we get sick and other things happen as well. But I try to, in everything, give that over to uh, the Lord Look at um, our chapter here. I want to go down to verse 21 and read that. It says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him, as we read earlier. Judas uh, saith unto him, and not Judas Iscariot, uh, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? 
Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. There's an earmark. Somebody tells you they're a Christian, but you watch what they, and they're not keeping his saying. It really makes you wonder, doesn't it? But if we are doing what he says because we love him, we'll be a good testimony for the Lord. He goes on, he says, And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, because yet, uh, or being yet present with you, uh, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give uh, you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, uh, neither uh, let it be afraid. And so we, we are to keep his commandments, and he's going to reveal himself uh, to us. If we keep his words, God loves us, and both Jesus and the Father will come and abide with us. That's pretty good news, isn't it? Uh, it's pretty good uh, comforting, if you will, that God give, gives to them and all Christians who realize uh, just what our Lord Jesus is saying here. If we do not keep his sayings, then we do not love him. It's not me saying that. I'm telling you what we are all looking at here, just, just announcing it. And it's, it's powerful uh, things. It, it's very serious. Uh, I wouldn't want anybody to go out of here thinking that all along I thought I was a Christian, but, you know, I haven't been keeping the Lord's words. I haven't been uh, of keeping his commandments uh, the way that I, I, I think that I should do them. Remember, uh, in John, who wrote these very things, penned them under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, also uh, wrote in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus, and uh, oh wait, oh, I'm getting mixed up with Romans. Uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The same John was inspired of the Holy Spirit to pen that. Who penned these things here? What it means is Christians are not perfect. But we have to go to the Father and get our hands cleaned up. But they say, Lord, forgive me. I, I didn't mean to do that. Get me back on track. Oh, allow your Holy Spirit to get me back on track and get things right with uh, the Lord. Now, you might be thinking Jesus is being really repetitive here. It seems like it just goes over and over and over. And I thought to myself, yeah, that's true. But he's infinite and we're finite. We need re repetition. Jesus was a master communicator. After all, he's God. <laughs> and he used repetition a lot. I don't mind using repetition. I need repetition myself. I read the Bible a lot. And it's repetition, but I need it. Jesus, the master communicator, teaching his disciples here, yes, he's repeating things to them. They needed it the way that he could uh, uh, speak to them. And he told them the comforter will uh, teach them when Jesus is gone because they needed this continual feeding from God. That's what Peter was commanded by G uh, Jesus, by the way, to feed my sheep. That's what all pastors know because that's what all pastors want to do, feed his sheep sheep feed them what the word of god the food of the bible so here's the comforter he's teaching us i like that the holy spirit you know uh here is jesus tells us he's going to bring it to our minds and remind us we're going to remember these things because of the holy spirit the other day I saw a commercial on there, and they, they're always trying to hit seniors, I think, because I, I watch the Friendly Channel, and I know a lot of seniors do, and I think uh, they always try to hit them there, and they said, here, here's a new memory pill. You take this, boy, all your memory's going to come back like that, and, you know, it's going to be a flash of lightning, and you'll feel like you're, you know, 16 again or something, and your memory's really sharp. And, uh, anyway, I thought to myself, I'm glad that the Holy Spirit reminds me things, aren't you? Hey, it, let, me, let me give you a little, uh, little advice here. Try this out. 
If you are forgetting things, cry out to God. Say, Lord, help my memory. And if the Lord decides not to, well, that's okay, because these pills aren't going to last. The Holy Spirit will always be with us. And sometimes God just allows us in our final 25% of our life for certain things to happen. That's just this world. We're not going to be in a perfect body at any time in this world. It's always when you're born, you go through that whole phase, and it's always coming up to the end point, which is decaying, you know, body falling apart, all that kind of stuff, until we just pass on to be with the Lord. That's why our great hope as Christians is someday we'll get a new body. We ain't going to have these problems no more. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for that. He's watching out for us, okay? Um, and so I thank the Lord for his Holy Spirit to bring me any memory he can, especially from Scripture, because it's so helpful for us. Now, look again here at verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, Give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither is, let it be um, afraid, he says. And so Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace. Well, what does that peace mean in the context here? Well, Jesus, the very peace of Jesus, I, I think of it this way. It's, you know, it's kind of difficult. I mean, how do, you, how do you say what peace is? I think it's similar for all of us because it's the very peace of God that we, we get. But we might describe it a little bit differently. Uh, I'll describe it like this, in this context, uh, that it's the tranquil state of a Christian soul knowing that they're saved. Oh, it just eliminates so much, so much confusion in our life, so much uncertainty that we have no peace. But once we come to know Christ as our Savior and God places his Holy Spirit in us, we have a peace that passes understanding. If we lose that, we need to get back and say, hey, Lord, what's going on in my life? Hey, you know, is there something I've done? What's happening? And just have a discussion with God about it and say, help me have that peace back. Get that peace back. I love it when I have that peace of God. That relationship is restored. You feel great. I have all my brothers that I love and my sisters in the Lord. And uh, I'm at peace with them. I mean, that's when we understand what Jesus, when he said, I give you my peace. Jesus, as he walked uh, this earth, despite all the troubles that he had, what did he have? Peace. Nothing bothered our Lord. He was a peaceful man in a violent, violent world. And as he traveled, there wasn't anything that was ever going to change the peace that he had. And so... Christ, his peace allows us to, to have a, uh, that stillness within us, a stillness with God and with others. You know, for a moment, if you can just think about Jesus in the bottom of a ship, the scripture sh shares a story about that, and he was down in there sleeping. And a big storm come up, and all the disciples, you know, some went down there and tried to wake him up, says, don't you know what's happening? Oh, what's going on? You know, all the storm, and they all, you know, were all fearful and everything. And Jesus, all he did was just make a few announcements to the wind and the storm, and it all went away. What happened? Tranquility, peace. Oh, that's good. Comfort. All those superlatives, okay, happened at that time. Now, if you have the peace of Jesus available to you, the storms of life are always going to come to us. But remember Jesus in that ship down in the bottom. He was present. Just remember he's in your heart. And when those storms come, say, Lord, give me peace during this so I can think properly with a sound mind and get through this, asking his Holy Spirit to guide you. See, that's what God wants for us. We're his children. Why would he teach us anything else but to be like him? All right. I know it's been long, but it's been good in the word of God, too. I think Phil took up all that extra time singing there at the end, but no, just kidding. Let's look at these last couple verses, and then we're, I'm going to wrap it up. We'll be done here in just a moment. Verse 28, we'll close out the chapter. You have heard now 
or heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If he loved me, look at that loved, past tense, he would rejoice because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass that when it is come to pass, ye might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. Right away I thought to myself, Jesus says, I love my Father, and uh, his commandments, I do them. And then he tells us, if you love me, do my commandment. You see the repetition there again, and it shows you the sequence and, and the, the hierarchy, if you want to uh, use that term. Uh, don't use it uh, too concretely, but it, it works that way. And uh, so these final verses here reminded the disciples that Jesus would leave and come to them again. And they should rejoice in this, uh, you know, their faith. Uh, perhaps lacking a little bit here. That's why Jesus has to re remind them that here. They're told when it happens, then they will believe. And they say, oh, Jesus said that. Oh, yeah, now I remember. And uh, it, it seems a little confusing, but it's not. Remember, he's teaching them these things. And it's interesting to note here that the Lord shared with him that the prince of the world cometh, and he has nothing in Jesus. Remember where we're at here in this passage of Scripture. We're down to hours before Jesus is going to be crucified. And so, yeah, the devil was in the immediate area working his bad works. Jesus noted nobody else knew what the devil was doing, but Jesus knew. And he's telling them that, yeah, he's here making ready for our Lord's uh, crucifixion. But our Lord said, I love God and do his commandment. He would go to the cross. He would die for our sins and open the door of salvation for whosoever calls upon his name. And so I close with this. Do you love Jesus? He loves you. Let's ask God's blessing on his word. Father in heaven, we thank you this morning for this passage of scripture that, oh Lord, it just brings back the joy of my salvation to me when I think of it, that you love us so much. Help us, Lord, to do your commandments. Help us to be reminded of them. Help us, uh, Lord, in all of our ways to please you. We'll give you the praise and the thanks as you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand at this time. If you grab a hymnal there, you can turn to number 219. Kind of a peppy song, but that's okay for an invitation. It's open, and if you'd like to come and pray up here this morning for any reason, please feel free to do that. Or if you want to speak to Pastor about something uh, for just a moment, we have time for that during the invitation as well. Sheila. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like I've got joy like the fountain, I've got joy like the fountain in my soul, I've got joy like the fountain, I've got joy like the fountain, I've got joy like the fountain in my soul. Thank you.
thank you all for being here to, this morning. I hope you can come back uh, for tonight's service. We're uh, back in the continuing on in the book of Acts. Let's go ahead and ask God's uh, blessing upon this time that we've had together. Father, I do thank you so much uh, for your watch care over us. During this hour, Lord, I pray that we've worshipped you in the way that we prayed for. I hope that we've done that in truth and in spirit, and that we opened our hearts to the Holy Spirit of God this morning. Lord, and you've drawn us closer to you and your relationship with us, and we'll give you the praise and the thanks for everything that you've done here. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed at this time. Thank you.